Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Gang. Good morning, students. Can you hear me? OK, if you can't at any time, you may not lose much, but let me know. OK. So I'm going to speak to you today about what? About the Holocaust. Who knows what that is? Anybody? What's a Holocaust? A Holocaust, as we refer today, is the um, killing of approximately 6 million Jews and 5 million non-Jews non -Jews during the Second World War. Um, I, I have about an hour's time, is that it? Half hour. Half hour? I will try to give you a little idea of what life or death was like for a prisoner at that time, and still uh, try to keep a few minutes at least for some questions and answers. But uh, mostly I'll tell you about what happened to me personally. Uh, what kind of an accent do I have? Anybody? German. I don't know jo uh, Polish, but I was born in Vienna, Austria, as you were told, and they speak German there. Um, on March 13th, 1938, when I was 15 years old, you know already how old I am now, I don't have to ask you, um, I was kicked out of school. I went to public school, like you do, and with one stroke I was out of school, period. Well, that maybe you may think this isn't quite so bad. But uh, within a few days, we were outfitted with something like this. The Star of David had to be securely sewed on on every outer garment to mark a Jewish person. And as such, a second-rate person. For example, if we met a soldier or anybody in a uniform, we had to get off the sidewalk and walk on the road and allow them to use the road only. We were not allowed to go and shop except during one hour from 12 to 1 at noon. <clears throat> we had uh, special, we received uh, special tickets for food. They were stamped with a big red J. All bank accounts of Jewish persons were closed. All businesses were taken away with one stroke. The Jewish community of Austria was impoverished. All the uh, anti-Jewish laws that took uh, five, six years to develop in Germany, they are put into effect in Austria overnight. So I was without school, and I was one of thousands of kids roaming the streets when we could, not doing anything at all. We, after my parents lost their jobs and their businesses, I had to go and bring a meal from a uh, soup kitchen that was put up by American organizations as a food for my family, which, by the way, consisted the immediate family of only my sister, a younger sister. She, by the way, survived the war in England. She went to England with a children's transport. And uh, my parents, but in addition, I had uncles and aunts, six cousins, and I don't know how many. My sister survived the war in England, and one of my cousins was able who survived the war in the United States. He emigrated before the war broke out. 
That's the entire family that survived. I could stand here and probably talk to you about for three, four hours just what happened to me personally, but I will select certain uh, times, certain eras of my past. In order to escape the uh, deportations that took place to areas in the east, nobody knew exactly where, somewhere in Poland, because the war broke out soon after Austria was annexed, a year later, a little over a year later. And uh, the Jews were taken in trains to the east. Nobody ever heard from them again. So my mother and I, my father died of a stroke. Uh, there were no physicians to treat him before. Jewish physicians, of course, were not allowed to practice. Non-Jewish physicians did not want to uh, treat a Jewish patient. He died, thank goodness. And my mother and I <coughs> uh, gave our last possessions to a farmer living in the area between, unfortunately, there's no map here, between Austria and Hungary. Uh, and he guided us at night in November of 1941 over the border into Hungary, where we were both interned in an internment camp. Stayed there over two years. I was often hungry, but never mistreated. These two and some years saved my life. In 1944, Although Hungary was an ally of Germany, the Germans invaded that country and shipped 500, half a million Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz. Among them, my mother and myself. I would like to tell you what it was like, how I remember that. Although these events were uh, over 60 years ago, there isn't a day that goes by when I do not think about some of these events day after day after day. We were um, in that Hungarian internment camp and uh, separated one day Jews from non-Jews and marched into a little town in Hungary where German troops were surrounding the railroad station and we were uh, inside a cordon of German SS guards. SS troops were special uh, units set up to treat uh, non-Germans and Jews and uh, prisoners and were really the worst of uh, a possible uh, guard units. <coughs> I saw inside there was a freight train of consisting of maybe 25 or 30 uh, closed freight cars with two little windows on each side, a large door in the center, and a plank leading up to the door. There was a sliding door. And upon a command, the SS began to drive the civilians that were sitting there on their, on their belongings, on their suitcases from the surrounding towns and villages into these cars without counting, without saying a word, taking their bayonets and their guns, and they drove us into this car. I was arriving in one of these cars, standing next to each other like herring. It was pitch dark, and we didn't know what happened. And they closed that door, and we stood there. 
The two windows on the side, they are boarded up with wooden planks. It took us hours before we could figure out that half the people on one side of the car could sort of squat in each other's lap, and the others would be able to sit on the floor within each other, and then we would take turns. We didn't have any food. We didn't have any water. There were no sanitary <clears throat> facilities. There were men, women, children, old and young. In some cars, I understand, babies were born. In every car, people died. It took us a long time before we felt the cars moving. It moved, we went sometimes for hours, and we stood for hours to the best of my recollection, that trip took about three days and two nights. And when we finally arrived at our destination, I could hear they were opening some of these sliding doors. And I was at that time standing close to the front the soldiers opened the door, and the light came in. We were almost blinded by the light. We're not used to that. And I looked out, and I saw we must have arrived at a railroad station, because uh, there were several trains, similar trains, arriving at other railroad sidings. And there were thousands and thousands of people milling around, civilians, guards, and people with funny-looking stripes. The uniforms that looked like, uh, I don't know, blue and gray striped pajama types uniform. Uh, After a while, some soldiers came and yelled, and everybody who was able to could, had to jump out from the cars. The others were thrown out. We had to line up, facing in one direction, in rows of fives, men separate from women. And I stood there, and I looked. And I thought that I had arrived at a huge station. There were thousands of people there. And something else I noticed. There was a terrible smell in the air, such as I'd never experienced. And although it was sunny and summer, the sun did not shine quite as bright. It was as if a cloud was hanging in the air. I didn't know what that was, and we didn't pay much attention. Slowly, we progressed towards the front, and pretty soon I found myself opposite a German soldier with a whip in his hand. And each prisoner was marched in front of him, and he pointed with that whip, left or right, left or right. And whichever direction he pointed, a prisoner was shoved. We again had to line up in rows of fives. I noticed that the direction in which I was directed was consisting of the people were mostly younger people, while the older ones, children, were all sent to the other side. I didn't know what that meant. 
but later found out that I had just passed my first selection. Pretty soon we were marched away to a beautiful uh, area first, consisting of uh, wooded trails, trees, flowers, but always accompanied by guard towers with guards in there and guns. And as I was marching there, one of the fellows in a row ahead of me slowly turned and walked into the woods, slowly, like this. The guards yelled at him, stop, stop, and he wouldn't stop. Then the guards made a signal to the guard towers. A few shots rang out. A machine gun started out, and the man fell down dead. The guards pointed two. Two men had to go into the woods, drag the man out, and drag him behind the column. That was my reception in Auschwitz. When we arrived at the first barracks, I found a huge hall where we had to undress completely, separate our shoes, our clothing, everything else, our pockets cleaned out, our watches, rings, eyeglasses, and then we were shown of our hair down to about, at that time I had hair, you know, uh, to about maybe an inch, an inch and a half, except in the middle, we had a strip down to the skin. We looked at each other, we looked like something out of a zoo. Then we were assembled outside, but then it was night. We stood outside all night. In the morning, we were rushed to another barracks and then into a shower where cold water ran down. We stood outside for hours, we rushed to another barracks where they threw one of these gray and blue striped tops at us, each one got a top and a pair of pants. Nothing else, nothing else. Can you imagine what that meant? No underwear, nothing to remind you of a human existence. That's how we had to go through, and in my case, summer and winter, a whole year. Eventually, we got a uh, metal dish. At the time in Auschwitz, I only had a metal dish. For every, th every third person got a metal dish. And once a day, we got a soup. And if you are good in imagination, you can imagine what happens when three people try to drink from one metal dish. But eventually we got each one a metal dish and a spoon. I could stand here and talk to you for hours about what happened to me. Uh, let me just say that I don't know what our life expectancy was, but um, in that one camp where I spent most of my time Thousand men were working on road buildings with one black water that they called coffee in the morning. For lunch, we got a soup at workplace where they took it out in the country where we worked on road buildings. 
And at night, we got a piece of bread and sometimes a little bit of uh, margarine. And again, a uh, heavier soup that they called vegetables. At that uh, diet, people died like flies. And every few weeks, new transports came in to keep the uh, camp operating at 1,000 men each. I could stand here and talk to you for hours about what happened. I don't know how much time I have. Another 10 minutes? And I would like to tell you about uh, the uh, events when Germany was finally uh, being uh, invaded by Russian and Allied troops, more so than when I came to Auschwitz. Uh, we were one of the most precious cargo and the first ones to be evacuated from that camp because the Russians were within 100 miles or so of our camp. We were marched out on foot, given an extra piece of bread, and marched all the way into Czechoslovakia, where we <clears throat> were put on freight trains. This time it was uh, winter, and we were put into open cars, standing like herrings again next to each other, like I described to you before, and without food on every train trip. I passed a uh, city. I was one of the few ones that recognized the name of the city. There was a handwritten notice there called uh, Prague and uh, other cities in Germany. And uh, we saw the destruction that American and British planes did to German cities. And we are taken to another camp called Bergen Belsen. Anybody ever heard that name? No. You heard of that? It was one of the worst camps because there was no more work. There was no more food. And I don't know how long I stayed there until my liberation on April 15th, 1945, by British troops. I wasn't able to walk anymore. I could just move myself on the floor. Most of the SS troops had run away and were replaced by Hungarian troops taking over the camps, shooting everything that came too close to the gates. People were dying at a rate that I had never seen before. But for three days, all these starving people had to form groups of four and take one of the bodies laying there. There were thousands and thousands of bodies laying there, some of them for months. Tie strings to the hands and the feet and drag four men to drag a body to great big ditches dug out by the German army, and upon a command, swing the body into the center of the pit. If we didn't have the strength, so didn't coordinate our movements, sometimes the guards pushed the person into the pit too, because they were mad we didn't put them 
in the middle. And then these people died there because they could never climb out of it again. And one day, we heard shooting. And I looked out from that barrack where I was housed on the floor laying there. I saw tanks of a different color, soldiers with different uniforms, speaking a different language. And I knew I was free. I and a friend of mine who was in a little better shape crawled out from these barracks and he went to the soup kitchen where they had the kitchen for both the guards and the prisoners and other kitchens. And <clears throat> he was able to get a little bit of uh, flour from one of the containers in a, we didn't have any bags, of course, in a uh, cement sack paper, which he formed a little bag from, and he brought that to me. And we had some flour. What are we going to do with that? I approached one of the soldiers, British soldier, and asked for a match. And he gave me a match after we put some of the straw from the straw sacks on the ground on a little stone and put a pot full with water on top and mixed that water with the flour. And then we lit the straw. The water, of course, never boiled it, but became warm. And that was my first meal after liberation. The next day, I got a Red Cross package. And I want to tell you, there were wonderful things in there. <laughs> it was toilet tissue. There were hardtack, you know, uh, swieback, toast, uh, condensed milk, cans with meat, you name it. I hadn't seen this for years. I just was able to open it up, and I took out some hardtack, and I chewed on that. And then I was so exhausted and so tired, I climbed on my cot, slept on this straw, and I put the package under my head as a pillow, and I was asleep. And I came to, the package was gone, and I found only one can of condensed milk. So I dragged myself out from that barracks and on the outside found on the ground a rusty nail. And I picked up a stone, probably just a pebble, and I took that condensed milk and I hammered on that nail to open the milk. And I didn't have the strength to open the can of milk. And then I looked around, and I saw in that mud, in that camp, there was nothing but dead and dying. Corpses were laying around. The tanks looked different, and the soldiers looked different. But the dying went on and on. And I did something that I hadn't done for years. I broke down and began to cry. 
And I was sitting there in the mud, it was raining, holding that can of milk and crying. When a soldier walked by and saw me there among that mess, came up to me and asked me whether he could help me. I just shook my head. But then I remembered my sister was in England and she was in a little town called Luton, L-U-T-O-N. And I said to that soldier, is there anybody in your outfit from Luton? And you know, that soldier looked at me as if I was insane. And it sounded like that. You, you, you come across an animal-like creature and he, as if you would meet somebody in a desert and the guy says, say, aren't you from Vizetta? This is how it sounded. He looked at me and he said, don't go away. Of course, I couldn't go away. A few minutes later, he came with a nurse and a, an officer. And the officer says, why do you want to know anybody from Luton? I said, because my sister is there. My sister is there. So the nurse says, I am from Luton. Tell me your sister's name. And she wrote down my sister's name. And the people she stayed with, as far as I could remember, and she said she was going to go on furlough and in a few weeks, and she was going to try and find my sister and tell her that I was liberated. And then the officer says to me that he was a physician and he was trying to save me. He picked me up and took me to a <clears throat> empty barracks, put me on a cot, took away the milk can I was still clutching in my hands, and said, don't eat or drink anything except what I will bring. And he went away and then came back with a huge can of black tea and a large canister of dry Zweibach uh, toast. For three days, he came back, talked to me. He washed me. He clean, cleansed me from the dirt, the filth, the lice that I had accumulated over the year. He brought me fresh clothing. He saved my life. And that, my friend, I will finish my uh, little speak, speech to you. I could, uh, of course, tell you for hours and hours what happened to me but I asked you in the beginning whether you knew what Holocaust was. And Holocaust really comes from the Greek. And it means something like fiery ending. And this is what happened to the people that were sent to the other side at a selection in Auschwitz. I'm not going to bother you with the details except to say that my mother ended up like that, also was forced to disrobe and shed all her belongings. But instead of being marched into a shower with water, she was marched into a different barracks where Cyclone B gas came out of the showers and the people were killed within a short period of time. 
under terrible circumstances. This is what happened to my mother and probably to most of the members of my family. <clears throat> but I wanted to close my remarks <clears throat> by telling you that <clears throat> although most of the guides were vicious, heartless, <clears throat> there were exceptions. And I remember, <coughs> excuse me, vividly towards the end, a German SS man who one day came to me and said, Fritz, that was my name, that had called me, go behind that shrub over there and see what I left for you there. And I went to that shrub, and there was a little package. And I opened the package, and there was a piece of poppy seed cake. Can you imagine what that meant under these circumstances? I want to tell you that to this day, <laughs> poppy seed cake is probably my favorite <laughs> dessert. I have talked to you for about half an hour. What, what was the reason for talking to you? What did I try to talk to you about? Anybody? Why do I come here? Do you think I enjoy that? Do you really think so? So why the hell do I do it? <laughs> anyway. Any, anybody? Any opinions? Why do I do it? <coughs> yes? So we know, but more importantly, so we don't forget. That we don't forget. That's an important item. Absolutely. Any other reasons, perhaps? I, I would like to tell you that... Uh, One of the reasons that I talk to you is that we should not judge our friends on the basis of how they talk, how they look, how they are clad. But what? On the basis of what? On the basis of what's here? and here. So don't ever judge anybody by the color of the skin or by the way they are clothed, but only by what's here and what's here. And try to remember that. You are young enough. When you go through life, you will face many situations. Try to remember that one guy that spent a great deal of his time in poor circumstances arrived at that conclusion. You should be able to do the same sooner than I. Because are we all prejudiced? Are you prejudiced? No. Are you prejudiced? No. Are you prejudiced? I tell you, you are wrong. You are prejudiced, you are prejudiced, and you are prejudiced, and I am prejudiced. But the difference is probably I fight it day and night. So we all have built in prejudices which we have to overcome in order to achieve a better society a better way of life, a closer community.
Thank you so much for your...